This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. My name is Peter Munoz. I'm a member of the Cal class of 1968, and I want to welcome everyone to today's program, which is sponsored by the Center for Civility and Democratic Engagement, which is founded by the class of 1968 and housed in the Goldman School of Public Policy. And the center's goal is to foster civility and cooperation in the democratic process in reaching solutions to the problems that face the state and the nation. Now, we are honored to have in the audience today Dean Henry Brady, who is the dean of the Goldman School and is also the faculty director of the center, and Larry Rosenthal, the program director of the center. I would like to introduce our moderator, Dick Beers. Dick is the illustrious member of the class of 1968. His accomplishments are too numerous to list today. Uh, just to a brief highlight, uh, Dick was the ASDC president in his last year at Cal. Uh, he is currently a UC Berkeley trustee and the center's, on the center's advisory board. He is now retired. For 35 years, he was a media executive with Time Warner, where his positions included president of Comedy Central and president of Court TV. In 2001, uh, Dick and his wife Carolyn funded the creation of the Beers Environmental Leadership Program on the Berkeley campus. In the past decade, over 350 environmental leaders from over 75 countries around the world have taken intensive training in sustainable development and practice. We'd now like to welcome Dick Beers. Thank you very much, and I want to express my appreciation to everyone involved with the class of 68 who always do an excellent job of organizing these events and having some really very stimulating speakers. Uh, today, the subject is minimum wage policy in California and the, and the U.S. and an emerging consensus across party lines. I should emphasize that phrase ends with a question mark. That's not stated with a certainty. Is there an emerging consensus here? And I'm very pleased today that we have three very distinguished panelists and speakers who have tremendous track records on what I must say is a very complicated subject. I think in these partisan times that uh, the minimum wage seems to be an issue which has some of the, I think, most interesting intellectual debate uh, it's an issue people care about passionately. There's a great deal of discussion about what the facts actually are. I'd like to very briefly introduce our three distinguished panelists, and I'm going to make it easy by saying they all have degrees from a combination of Yale, Harvard, Cambridge, and Stanford. But uh, most importantly, we're very pleased that they're in Berkeley today. That's, that's the important fact. Uh, I'm going to introduce them all at once, and I'm going to do it briefly. You have materials which provides more detail, uh, which I think it's worthwhile to read, but I'm going to introduce them in the order of which they'll speak. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes, which will give us adequate time for Q&A. And on a subject like this, I think it's probably uh, very important to have some discourse at the end. Our first speaker, immediately to my left, is David Newmark. He's the director of the Center for Economics and Public Policy at UC Irvine. He's a labor economist, and he's an expert in li on living wages, affirmative action, and sex differences in the labor market. He's also the co-author of a 2008 book, Minimum Wages. Uh, our next speaker to, his, to David's left is Ron Unz chairman of the Higher Wage Alliance, a theoretical physicist by training, uh, formerly publisher of the American Conservative, and also a person who I think is not uh, unwilling to take important positions on issues which are quite controversial. Uh, he drafted Proposition 227, replacing bilingual education, 
Uh, with English immersion, it passed with 61% of the vote, and there has been uh, a very dramatic increase in test scores in the three years after its passage. Uh, he also uh, played a real role in opposition to Proposition 187, uh, which I think it's safe to characterize it was an anti-immigration proposal. Uh, also, uh, our, our last speaker is Saru Jayaraman, who is here at Berkeley. She's the director of UC Berkeley's uh, Food and Labor Research Center. She's a lecturer at the Goldman School as part of the Berkeley Food Institute, another very exciting initiative on the campus, which I hope you'll take time to learn more about. And she's also the co-director of rest the Restaurant Opportunity Center, which now has, which deals with workplace justice issues and now has 13,000 members. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, David, and he's going to do a very helpful role for us, which is providing a context for our discussion by discussing the issues of what do we know about the effect of minimum wages from previous legislation. Uh, I also would note that I think this, in these times, it's a very important time to focus as much on data as dogma. And I think it's very helpful to have this context at the outset of our discussion. And I know we will have some very uh, important comments from our other speakers as well. Thank you. Uh, Ron used to be on my right, but now he's on my left, so I guess uh, I would say, um, apparently, uh, I, I would, I would uh, disagree with, with an equal balance between data and dogma and suggest it ought to be about uh, maybe 99%, 1%. It, it all, I direct the Center for Economic and Public Policy at UCI, and, and the, uh, the reason I created the center um, was because being involved with public policy on a lot of issues, not just minimum wages, um, it was clear that there was a dramatic need for, for data and research. Um, not that that's decisive in settling most issues, as you'll find out here as well, um, but without it, you're just lost, and policymakers are, are doing things based on, you know, dogma and sometimes motives that have nothing to do even with the policy at hand. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to talk about what research tells us uh, about the minimum wage. I wouldn't say, you may, you may or may not view this as completely neutral, in this, but I'm giving you my view. I've been working on this topic. Uh, I hate to say this, for almost 30 years after being told as a grad student that we knew everything there was to know about minimum wages and it was a waste of time uh, for grad students to spend their time on this. Uh, so let me tell you first of all why we're having this discussion um, and, and why we've been having it for a while. And that is the rise in inequality. When, when President Obama talks about the rise in inequality, he's, he's spot on. Uh, he's not the first one to notice this, obviously. And I certainly believe he, he passionately cares about it and would like to do something about it. So, so there's two series here. Uh, the yellow one is, uh, the, the, is, the, is the ratio, you can see it starts at around four, between earnings at the 90th percentile of the, of the, of the earnings distribution, that means only 10% are higher than you, right, and 90% are below. So when they say the top 1%, that would be the 99th, only 1% are higher than you. So that's, that's near the top, that's where, you know, upper middle class and, and higher, let's say, relative to the, to the 10th percentile. People who are near the bottom, only 10% are below. And you can see what's happened to that ratio for over, the 19th, over the last 40 years. Uh, it's gone from about four, it had risen to as high as six before the Great Recession hit. The Great Recession was actually um, in some ways worse for, for high income people than low income people, not in terms of jobs, but in terms of earnings. But you can see still, the, the trend is clearly a dramatic rise in inequality. The, the, the orange line at the bottom is less dramatic, but that's partly a, a trick of the scale, because to get the people at the top and you got to make the scale really big. That's the ratio between the median, so exactly half, you know, half people above, half below, and the 10th percentile. And you can see that has increased from about, about a little, little over two to, if you sort of take out the Great Recession, about two and a half. So inequality has increased there as well. One thing you will notice, though, and it is relevant to the minimum wage debate, is a, the, the, the really big change in inequality is at the top, right? People at the top and at the very top and at the very, very top have just zoomed away from everybody, right? And that's important to keep in mind. Minimum wage isn't gonna do anything about that, right? That's pretty clear. But there is still something going on at the bottom. Um, what about the minimum wage? Well, the way we do the minimum wage in this country, so far at least, and it's still in most states, uh, is we, we, we pass legislation to choose a nominal minimum wage level nationally at 725 now, for example. Um, and, and then every once in a while, you know, with, with sort of uh, frequency based on who knows what exactly, um, uh, it goes up. So what you see here is the real minimum wage. That's the minimum wage relative to prices, okay? 
Um, and this is in 2011 dollars. So you can see towards the end there, it's actually a little a shade below seven and a quarter now just because of prices. Um, so what you see is a decline from the 70s through the 80s. That's because the minimum wage didn't go up at all in that time and inflation was high, right? So it just gets eroded. And then the, the, the increases are always legislated increases in the minimum wage, right? So the, those jump up the minimum wage in real terms and then it declines again. So the minimum wage has, you know, certainly through the first half of that period until around 2000 has certainly declined in real terms. Uh, since then, uh, it's it sort of held steady because there have been somewhat more frequent increases. Uh, in so that's all about wages. That's about what people earn for working, right? Um, what we really care about, and this is a very important point I'll come back to, is, is probably is, is poverty or actually family income. What this graph is meant to show you is, is the following. The yellow line is the poverty rate. So that's the left-hand scale. That's the percentage of individuals in poverty. And you can see it's been around, it, it was at its low, right? The, you see the Clinton boom here, the end of the 1990s. The poverty rate actually declined for the first time in a long time in US history. Um, and then it sort of crept up slowly, and then it shot up somewhat during the Great Recession. Um, the orange line is, is economic growth, right? Which obviously trends up, right? It, 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 it dipped down during the Great Recession, of course. So the basic story is there's been a lot of economic growth, right? We've had a steady upward trend in GDP per capita. Poverty has been pretty persistent, right? So economic growth doesn't seem to be delivering declines in poverty. So that's background. And the background suggests three reasons we should raise the minimum wage, or at least we're talking about it, depending on your perspective. The minimum wage has generally not kept up with inflation, meaning the low-skilled have to some extent been fallen behind. Many changes, the minimum wage is actually a small contributor to this globalization and, and technological change are much bigger. Um, many changes have led to greater inequality, right? Bigger differences between low wage, middle wage, and, and high wage workers. And a growing economy hasn't really delivered reductions in poverty, okay? But the answer is not so clear. Um, economists, you know, favorite phrase is unintended consequences. Uh, and it doesn't mean we're smarter than everyone else, um, but we, we sort of, we, we, make our, we, we, we make our money thinking through the consequences of, of if governments intervening in markets and what it does. Well, uh, if all a minimum wage does is raise the wage of low-wage workers and that's it, no-brainer, right? If you want to help them, raise the minimum wage. Okay, but that may not be the only effect of the minimum wage. The other issue is what are the distributional effects, right? Who wins and who loses, right? Is it clear that if we raise wages of low-wage workers, we're really helping low-income families, okay? Uh, and we want, to, we want to look at the evidence on that and ask whether the, the evidence is kind of consonant with the goals of the policy. So two slides of what economics tells us, or maybe one, I can't recall. Um, uh, what does economic theory tell us, at least the standard theory? When something becomes more expensive, in almost all cases, we use less of it, right? We tax cigarettes because teenagers are very price sensitive to cigarettes, so we think we discourage smoking among teenagers and hence later smoking by raising the price of cigarettes. When gasoline tax, you remember in the last the, the, the 08 election, we had a huge run-up in gasoline prices. Remember the candidates arguing about that? Um, dramatic changes in the kind of cars people were buying. That's sort of when Priuses took off. We, turning things around, we subsidize things we want people to do. We have pretty extensive subsidies for green technology now, and lo and behold, a lot of solar getting installed on people's roofs. Um, because you lower the price, people do more of it. These responses don't surprise us at all. They strike us as common sense. And in fact, they're not just common sense, because common sense sometimes is wrong. Uh, they're borne out by the data. Okay, what about the labor market? Well, labor markets are more complicated, right? Um, in the standard model, however, here's the basic story. Uh, you raise the minimum wage, low-skilled labor becomes more expensive. That raises the cost of production to companies. What do they do? They try to economize on the use of low-skilled labor, right? They might hire maybe fewer, but higher skilled workers. They might make investments in capital instead of labor. Um, they might just let consumers bear the burden of longer lines, fewer cashiers, uh, et cetera. Um, those, all those changes, though, raise production costs, and those production costs raise prices to consumers. And it's the higher prices to consumers that, of course, lead to somewhat less consumption of whatever those businesses produce, and that's why those firms will use less labor. So that's the theory. That's not a, I'm not stating facts here. I'm stating what the standard model predicts should happen. Okay, is the theory right? It's not the only theory, but I have 15 minutes, so we're not gonna get into other theories. Um, well, earlier studies, uh, going kind of through, we're going back to, to, to through the 1970s, let's say, pretty much used aggregate data on the US to try to figure this out. And, and, and I'll use the phrase minimum wage elasticity a lot. That's the way things are summarized. What is that? Well, it's highlighted in yellow. It's the percent change in employment of the affected group, not of workforce as a whole, of the affected group, divided by the percent change in the minimum wage. So for these early studies said the minimum wage elasticity was, say, minus 0.1 to minus 0.2 pretty consistently. What does that mean? 
10 percent increase in the minimum wage reduces employment of strongly affected groups, that is, very low skilled workers, by 1 to 2 percent. And actually, if you go back to the CBO study that came out a few weeks ago, they're a little below that range, but that's, that's but, but in the ballpark. Okay. Um, the great thing we have in the United States is 50 states plus the District of Columbia doing largely whatever the heck they want. Um, so uh, there's a ton of research on, on labor market policy in the U.S. because we get a, a lot more what I will call uh, experiments. We have sort of this economics laboratory. Um, what has happened over time is states have gotten into the game of raising their minimum wage faster than the federal. A state can't have a lower minimum wage, but they can have a higher minimum wage. This is simply the number of states with a minimum wage above the federal. And you can see there was none of this action in the 1980s. In the late 80s, it jumped up for the first time and then sort of came down again because the federal minimum wage went up. And then over the 2000s, you had a huge run up so that actually before the last federal increases in 07, uh, 32 states had minimum wages higher than the federal. And now, because the federal minimum hasn't changed for about five years, uh, it's starting to happen again with more states uh, thinking about and raising their minimum wages. So we, we get a ton of evidence from this, which is why I love it as a labor economist. Uh, what do we learn from this? Well, um, I did an extensive review of everything that was published kind of in this whole new wave of research using state minimum wages uh, in the 1990s and 2000s. And, and that evidence w was not unambiguous. It never is. This is a social science, not an experimental science. We're not looking for Higgs boson or anything. Um, uh, but most of the studies find negative effects. And what, what, what we deemed, somewhat subjectively, but I think correctly, to be the more credible studies overwhelmingly found evidence of negative minimum wage effects on employment with elasticities in that same kind of minus 0.1 uh, to minus 0.2 range. Um, this is contested, for, to be sure. Um, there, are, there have always been papers in the history of the minimum wage literature, and it's actually literature that is 100 years old, believe it or not. Um, uh, there have always been some papers that don't find disemployment effects. It's a small, the, of the recent work, it's a, it's a small minority of studies, despite the description of it in the media. Um, hinges on restrictions on data that, are, that may be right, but they're, they seem to be, they're largely untested. Um, and what we've done so far suggests that they're not really unsupportable, in some cases badly flawed data. I would say the following. It's a bad idea to overthrow a large body of research showing that minimum wages causes some job loss based on a handful of contrary studies, unless those contrary studies really establish that the earlier work was wrong. And that happens sometimes, uh, but it hasn't happened here yet. You know, I would say you could read the climate change literature, and there are certainly studies that say climate change isn't real or man-made climate change isn't real. Um, but that doesn't mean the consensus is wrong. It just means that in a, in a field where it's tough to figure out exactly what's going on and climate change is harder than minimum wages, um, uh, there's always going to be contrary studies. Okay, so, so you might think, uh, end of story, in business groups that don't like the minimum wage, for obvious reasons, um, kind of stop there. They say minimum wages you know, reduce jobs, uh, job killer, end of story. Well, that's way too simplistic, right? We have lots of government regulations with lots of goals, some good, some bad, depending on your perspective, uh, and most of them cost somebody a job somewhere, right? If we adopt serious carbon, um, carbon reduction legislation, you know, oil refinery workers in Louisiana are not going to be happy. They're going to they're going to take a big hit to their earnings. Does that mean we shouldn't do it because it kills jobs in Louisiana? Uh, it, it's, it's open to debate, but if you think we need to address climate change, obviously people working in the industry that puts a lot of carbon in the atmosphere are going to suffer. Um, so we have to think about, and this is true of any policy you can think of, what are the benefits, what are the costs, and how do we, and it, it's by no means easy, how do we roughly weigh those costs and benefits and decide what to do? Well, 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 why do we raise the minimum wage in the first place? Most people argue, not quite everyone, but most people argue that the goal is to reduce poverty and somewhat more generally to help low-income families. Okay? Um, Ted Kennedy, uh, in, his, in his biography, said the minimum wage, autobiography, uh, sorry, biography, the minimum wage is one of the first and is still one of the best anti-poverty programs we have. Uh, President Obama very recently, nobody who, lives, nobody who works full-time should have to live in poverty. Well, if, a minimum, if, if we help low-wage workers, you might think, we must help low-income families, right? It must follow. Low-wage workers must be concentrated in low-income families. And here's some numbers that bear that out, right? If we look at families that are in that, that top row, less than that poor, that is, their, their income is below the poverty line, 85%, what I show you here is the distribution, 85% of low-wage workers are in poor families, right? That says minimum wages must target the poor very well. There's only one problem, apologies for playing games, those data are from 1939. Okay? Let's now look forward to the future and look what happens to that number. It goes from 80, 85% in 1939 to 17% in 2003. Okay? What happened? Well, uh, first of all, a lot more people and families work. Uh, second of all, back in 1939, there wasn't really a safety net. You couldn't really not work, right? Um, if you, if you um, 
if you think about families that are poor, the, the single most important reason families are poor is because nobody works, right? 52% of families in recent years in poverty have no workers. The minimum wage may not do much for them. Um, the other striking number is that about a third of minimum wage workers are in families in the top half of the income distribution. Okay, so there are, I see a few maybe teenagers walked in with parents for this, for this Cal Day thing. Uh, if you work, you're probably working at minimum wage or close to it, um, and I don't think we're doing the minimum wage uh, for you, because you probably, but I don't know, but in general, um, there's this issue of the target efficiency of the minimum wage. It's improved slightly in the last 10 years, but it's still, uh, it's still pretty bad. Um, so the bottom line is that raising the minimum wage may not do much to help the poor or even low-income families. Um, and the, the, if you take away one point from this, it's the following. Being a low-wage worker and being in a low-income family, they're obviously related, but they're, they're not the same thing at all, and they're, they're nowhere near synonymous. There are plenty of low-income families with no workers. There are plenty of high-income families uh, with low-wage workers. Okay, so the bottom line, and nobody in the minimum wage debate disagrees with this, really, um, minimum wages do not target benefits to poor families very well. Okay? Um, what actually happens when you raise the minimum wage? Well, we, I'll, 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 the third bullet gives you the answer, but you can think about the following. Suppose it's the middle class teenagers who get the higher wages and the poor single mothers who lose their jobs. Well, then you haven't helped the poor at all and you've probably hurt them. Right? Alternatively, suppose the middle class teenagers lose their jobs and, and, and the poor single mothers earn the higher wages. That would be a good thing from a distributional perspective. Okay? What actually happens? Not much of anything. Um, when the minimum wage goes up, there's, there's, there's study after study, one recent exception, which I won't, I'll, I'll get into if we get into the, discuss, into the discussion period, but there's a lot of studies which basically say you raise the minimum wage and nothing really happens to the poverty rate. There's a lot of moving income around low-income families. Some win, some lose. On net, uh, no, not much change. Okay? Is it as hopeless as it seems? Because that's just pretty hopeless so far. Um, well, yes and no. Uh, changes in the economy have made it worse for low-skilled workers. There is no question about it, right? And we're not going to reverse globalization. We're certainly not going to reverse technological change. This is a real problem um, that uh, we probably do have to live with. You know, there is the holy grail, as I have in quotes there, of raising skill levels at the bottom. Great idea. Anyone figures out how to do it, they'll be, they'll be, uh, they'll be, they'll be lauded to the sky. We've been working on reforming schools and teacher quality and training programs for decades. And we've made marginal improvements, but, but nothing, nothing very big. The challenge really is to increase incomes of low-income families without discouraging work. Okay? Um, and, and how do we do that? Well, the Earned Income Tax Credit is a policy that we've had around for, for almost 40 years now. And this is a policy that works well. And again, minimum wage advocates acknowledge it works well. They just say we should do the minimum wage as well. Um, what does the EITC do? Uh, it subsidizes your earnings if your earnings are low and if your family income is low. It happens on your income tax form, right? It's basically, you know, what's on your income tax form, how much money you make, the structure, family, do you have small kids, et cetera. There's formulas, and, you know, if your income is low enough, money comes back to you. We know the EITC does, does, does three things, right? First of all, it puts money in the hands of low-income families because you get a check. That's not hard. Um, second of all, it encourages employment by low-skilled people, especially low-skilled women with kids, because the EITC really is targeted to people with kids, which probably makes sense. And third, it actually increases the extent to which people earn their way out of poverty, right? It's a lot more magical, in a sense, to have a policy where you earn more, and that lifts you out of poverty, and then maybe you get even more from the government than just lifting people out of poverty by writing checks. Still may be something we want to do, given changes in the economy, but the EITC is a remarkably uh, successful policy, um, and I would argue um, it's what we should be focusing on. We do it already nationally. We spend a lot of money, more than we spend on welfare now. Um, some states have an EITC. California doesn't. It could. Um, at the national level, we could expand and extend it. Indeed, the president uh, has proposed doing that as well. Thank you. Well, anyway, thanks very much for uh, the opportunity to speak before you today on the minimum wage issue. And uh, I, I think given the nature of the debate, I'm hoping there will be a lot of interesting questions in the Q&A section that I can address. Now, one of the things that obviously has come up a lot once I became involved in the minimum wage issue a while ago is the question of how I got involved in it. Because for most of, as most of you probably know, I'm uh, somebody generally characterized as from a conservative Republican background or free market libertarian. And those 
ideological positions seem entirely discordant with the notion of raising the minimum wage, which has traditionally been presented as a liberal or left-wing type of issue. So I thought I'd give a little bit of my background on it in that for most of my involvement in public policy over the years, I've never really focused much on economic issues. But then a few years ago, I started thinking about some of the broader problems in our society and the social problems. And it suddenly struck me that a raise, a large hike, a major increase in the minimum wage would at a stroke address many of those different problems. And I wrote a major article about it in 2011. And then over the couple of years since then, I ended up speaking and writing a series of additional articles and that sort of thing. The funny thing about it is that the minimum wage in many ways has been so far off the main political radar screen in America for the last 20 or 30 years. Even many liberals or Democrats tended not to focus on it as a central policy proposal that it really had not become a foot political football in the debate in that neither conservatives nor liberals really paid much attention to it. Just to give you an example, Paul Krugman and Joseph Stiglitz are two of the most prominent liberal economists in the United States. Very prominent, very high profile. And yet until about a year ago, a year and a half ago, neither of them had been willing to publicly come out and support a large increase in the minimum wage. The minimum wage was viewed in many ways by the more academically qualified liberals as something old fashioned, an old policy proposal, something from the 1930s or 1940s or 1950s. And really shift, the country had shifted away from that sort of issue and had moved much more towards, for example, the earned income tax credit, which David Newmark recently uh, just uh, dealt with a moment ago. Yet, when you really sit down and look at it, I, I think the minimum wage and a large increase in the minimum wage would solve an awful lot of these different problems and do so much more effectively. The, the issue we have right now in American society, and you know, one reason I think the minimum wage is something that should be appealing in the right way to a lot of conservatives, is that the current system right now involves massive government subsidies for low-wage or impoverished workers in American society. In other words, people who work full-time in many cases for a living, but earn so little money that they can't survive on their paychecks, and therefore they receive government subsidies in exchange to keep them afloat via the income tax credit, via housing subsidies, via food stamps. The total dollars involved are over $250 billion a year. In other words, the taxpayers are providing massive support for low-wage workers, and they are paying the workers to survive rather than forcing the workers' employers to pay them. And from any logical perspective, whether a liberal perspective or a conservative perspective, that really doesn't make much sense. In other words, it's much better for employers, for businesses to pay their own workers than for the taxpayers to make up the difference. Obviously, that's not something necessarily supported by the businesses themselves and their lobbyists who have a tremendous amount of influence in Congress. And if you take something like the Earned Income Tax Credit, it really is essentially a government welfare program. It's the notion of the government sending checks to people based on the forms they fill out on their tax returns every year, sometimes with the help of tax advisors who skim off a large chunk of the money involved. And the dollars involved are not at all small. In other words, it's basically, you know, in many cases, 20% or 30% of their entire income coming from the federal government. Now, the, the point about the minimum wage is if you basically talk about a small increase in the minimum wage, just as David Newmark suggested, it would have relatively little impact on impoverished, on poor families in the United States. In other words, most of the money in many cases would go to teenagers from affluent families. But if you're talking about a large increase in the minimum wage, an increase not of a dollar or two dollars, but four dollars or five dollars or even six dollars, the distributional effects are entirely different. For example, in the case of my own proposal, which I've been working to try to put on the ballot, raising the California minimum wage to a figure of $12 an hour, that figure would in effect raise the wages of 40% of all the wage earners in California, which is a very large total. The average wage increase, 
would be $5,000 per year for an impacted worker, $10,000 for a couple. The average, the, any full-time worker in, the United, in California would make a minimum of $25,000 a year, $50,000 a year for a full-time wage earner couple. Those dollars are enough to lift almost all of the families out of poverty. And we're talking about a massive increase in California, the you know, wages involved. The other thing that really struck me as I started looking in the data is that the main impact of a much higher minimum wage would obviously be that the businesses involved, since the uh, impact would be that they would basically have to cover the cost of their workers, they would simply pass on the higher cost to the consumer, and that's entirely true. In other words, if you have a situation where the workers involved were in the tradable manufacturing sector, then there might be the question of foreign competition and the jobs being lost. But the vast majority of minimum wage or low wage workers in California or in the United States tonight are workers who are in the non-tradable service sector, who work at fast food restaurants, who work as uh, you know agricultural workers, who work at big box retail outlets, that sort of thing. And those jobs cannot be outsourced. They cannot be replaced by foreign competitors. In many cases, they involve personal services that are very expensive and difficult to automate. So the jobs would remain, but the prices would simply go up. And the price increases are extremely negligible compared to what most people would think. For example, studies have shown that Walmart, which is the largest low-wage employer in the United States, with over a million lower wage workers who earn under $12 an hour, they would simply have to raise their prices by 1.1% one time to accommodate the extra costs of a $12 an hour minimum wage. In the case of domestic agricultural products, the price on the store shelves would only go up by about 2%, a one-time increase of 2% to cover $12 an hour minimum wage for agricultural workers. In the case of fast food, it would be certainly more than that. But even so, a cheeseburger would only go up by about a dime to the retail buyer of cheeseburgers. And the impact of that would be fairly small, almost negligible, compared to the massive fluctuations, for example, we've seen in other consumer products, like gasoline a few years ago, where the prices sometimes went up by 20 or 30 percent per year, year after year. So if we're talking about a one-time price increase of 1 or 2 percent, with the average increase across all goods and services in the United States being probably 0.7 percent, there really would be relatively little impact in consumer use of those products, and the jobs would still exist. Furthermore, the money going to those families would be probably in the range of, in California, $15 billion a year extra. And if you put an extra $15 billion a year into those low-wage families, they're the households that spend every dollar they earn. And the end result is a massive fiscal stimulus impact something basically that would drive and revive the California economy, because those are the people who go and shop at Walmart, who go to fast food restaurants and buy there. So we're talking about something that re really have a very positive impact. Now, <clears throat> one of the interesting things when you discuss this from an ideological perspective, as I started focusing on the issue a couple of years ago, was that there was much, much less resistance to the notion of a higher minimum wage among my conservative and libertarian friends than the general public would expect. There are many people, for example, who would fight to the death a 0.1% increase in taxes, who are ideologically opposed to any increase in government spending, government tax benefits, all of those distributional programs. But the minimum wage does not fall into that category. The minimum wage, by raising the minimum wage, you automatically cut government spending. Because the families we're talking about are no longer so poor. They would no longer qualify for food stamps. They would no longer qualify for the earned income tax credit. Their government spending on them would decrease, and the taxpayers would therefore save money. On the national level, it probably would be in the range of 40 or $50 billion per year if we're talking about, for example, a $12 an hour minimum wage. 
Therefore, what you're talking about is simply forcing private employers to cover the wages of their own workers rather than shifting the burden to the taxpayer. That saves the taxpayer's money through these cuts in government programs, and it involves none of the ill effects <coughs> that many of these conservative or libertarian individuals are so concerned about. The only concern most people would have would be whether there would be a lot of job losses involved. Because obviously, if workers lose their jobs, the impact is the government has to cover their costs through welfare programs or things like that. But the evidence is job losses would be negligible. Take, for example, a couple of months ago, the uh, CBO, the uh, Congressional Budget Office, came out with a study on the likely impact of the Democratic proposal to raise the federal minimum wage by $10 to $10.10 an hour, and it was touted by opponents of the minimum wage as devastating to the pro-minimum wage case. It basically argued that raising the minimum wage to 1010 would cost the American economy 500,000 jobs, which sounds like a very large number, but it really isn't. The end result, when you look at, for example, what the CBO study showed, was that of the workers impacted by a minimum wage rise in the United States, the low-wage workers, 98% of those workers would get a wage hike, would increase their incomes. In many cases, increase their incomes by a life-changing amount of thousands of dollars per year. And 2% of those workers might lose their jobs. Now, in a situation where you're talking about a change in government policy, in which 98% of the impacted people benefit and 2% suffer, there are very few government policies that would have such an incredibly positive effect. Furthermore, many of the jobs lost would be lost by the teenagers that David Mar Dumark referred to. And it would be very easy to take a small fraction of the tens of billions of dollars in government savings through decreased social welfare spending and produce something, for example, authorize something like a targeted tax credit in which businesses that hire teenagers would receive a subsidy of a dollar or two or even three dollars per hour. And if you increase the subsidy, you could basically neutralize any of the ill effects of the job losses involved. And in fact, you could probably lower teenage unemployment to a smaller level than it is today. When you have a change in government policy that saves tens of billions of dollars in government spending, you can use a small fraction of the dollars to balance out any of the ill effects. I'm very pleased to see that in the months after I launched my effort and showed that there really was a strong case for conservative case for raising the minimum wage, you've seen a lot of people get on board with that. For example, Phyllis Schlafly, one of the iconic figures of the conservative right, endorsed a higher minimum wage. Bill O'Reilly, the biggest conservative on Fox News, endorsed it. Walmart, the biggest low-wage uh, employer in America, argue that you know, it might very well be possible that a raise in the minimum wage would benefit Walmart more than it would hurt Walmart. And Walmart in the past had also advocated a minimum wage. I, I think there's actually a fairly good chance right now that at least California will see minimum wage legislation pass through the state legislature later this year, possibly raising it to 12 or $13 an hour. And I think the results would be very positive, just as they were in 1996, when California boosted its minimum wage by about 30 or 40%, and unemployment dropped rather than increased. I'll be very glad to answer any questions during the Q&A. Thanks a lot. Hello. I'm very happy to be the last speaker. <laughs> Um, so, I, I don't know if you know who I am. My name is Sarah J. Rahman. I teach at the Goldman School of Public Policy, and I want to thank the Goldman School for asking me to come here today. I also run a research center here at UC Berkeley called the Food Labor Research Center. Uh, and I run a national organization called the Restaurant Opportunity Center. And my background is law. I went to Yale Law School, and I went to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and then ended up... Uh, doing this work for the last now 15, 20 years, um, fighting for the rights of low-wage workers throughout the economy. And uh, my life dramatically changed about 12 years ago on September 11th when uh, there was a restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center. If anybody has been to New York in those days, you may remember it was called Windows on the World. Um, on that morning, on 9-11, unfortunately, 73 workers died. 
and about 250 workers lost their jobs, and about 13,000 restaurant workers lost their jobs in the aftermath of the tragedy in New York City. And I was asked to come and uh, start a little relief center in the aftermath of the tragedy to help these workers get back on their feet. And we called it Rock, the Restaurant Opportunity Center. And what started as a little relief center post 9-11 has grown into a national organization. We now have 13,000 restaurant worker members in 32 cities across the country. We actually have 100 employer partners, <laughs> restaurant owners. Uh, many of them celebrity chefs, like you may have heard of Tom Colicchio, star of Top Chef. He's a great employer and a great partner of ours, all the way down to small mom and pop restaurants around the country who are actually doing the right thing, providing livable wages and working conditions to their employees and still, not still, but I, I would say because, not in spite of these great conditions that they offer their workers are growing pretty dramatically. So the reason why we've grown so dramatically over the last decade, or you know, actually 12 or 13 years, is the explosion in this industry. And I believe I was asked to come to speak about this industry because it is, the restaurant industry is the largest employer of minimum wage workers in the United States. So the restaurant industry also happens to be the second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of the entire economy. It's over 10 million workers right now, about one in 12 Americans works in the restaurant industry. It's one of the only industries to experience growth over the last couple of years of economic crisis rather than decline. And yet it happens to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. So every year the US Department of Labor puts out the 10 lowest paying jobs in America and every year we win the award. Six or seven of the 10 absolute lowest paying jobs in America every year are in the restaurant industry. And every year the two absolute lowest paying jobs, lower than farm workers, lower than every other occupation you can think of are restaurant jobs, the people who touch and serve our food. So you have to ask yourself, how is it that you've got the second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of the US economy proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs? I mean, they do, the National Restaurant Association does like to announce regularly that they are uh, announcing record high profit. So how is it that you've got such a profitable and growing industry proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs in our economy? It is because of the political power of an entity called the National Restaurant Association, which many people call the other NRA, and which has been named on, uh, you know, every year the Fortune magazine puts out what they call the Power 25, the 25 most powerful corporate lobbies in the United States. And every year the other NRA ranges between number 10 and number 23 as one of the most powerful lobbies in the United States and certainly the most employer, a powerful employer lobby in the United States and the largest voice on the minimum wage debate. So one of the key things to know about the National Restaurant Association is back in 1996, they were led by a man named Herman Cain who later tried to run for president uh, and failed miserably on the Republican ticket. Now, under Herman Cain's leadership in 1996, the National Restaurant Association struck a deal with Congress. They said, we will allow a very tiny increase in the overall minimum wage, as long as the minimum wage for workers who earn tips, which are 75% restaurant workers, servers, bussers, waiters, bartenders, stays frozen forever. And so the wage for tipped workers in the United States has been stuck at $2.13 an hour for the last 23 years. Which means that in 43 states in the United States, restaurant workers' wages, wages that they earn from their employer, range between two and five dollars an hour, right? Now, that's not true here in the state of California. Here in California, we have the same wage for tipped and non-tipped workers, but because you've got 43 states, six million workers in 43 states, earning a wage between two and five dollars an hour, their wages are actually so low, they go entirely to taxes, and they're living completely off of their tips. So what does it mean for six million workers in America to live completely off of their tips? What does it mean when you've got a political lobbying group that has essentially convinced Congress and hoodwinked the American people into basically saying, we shouldn't have to pay our workers' wages at all, Customers should pay our workers' wages 
for us. Well, let me tell you what it means. I've written a book about it. It's called Behind the Kitchen Door. And we have copies here if you're interested. One of the stories I tell in the book is a young woman who's actually a leader in our organization. Her name is Claudia Munoz. She was a graduate student at the University of Houston in Texas. She worked at the IHOP, a large multi-million dollar national, international, actually international house of pancakes. Uh, and earn $2.13 an hour, which is the wage for tipped workers in Texas. Now, the law says that these employers are supposed to make sure that tips make up the difference between $2.13 and the overall minimum wage of $7.25, but the manager of the IHOP mega corporation that it is, and even though it is illegal, told Claudia, I will not make up that difference. I do not want to be held liable for that difference. I don't actually care what you earn in tips. I'm going to report that you're earning $7.25 regardless of what you actually earn. And so Claudia at the IHOP, you know, shifts can be very slow at the IHOP, earns sometimes zero, sometimes three, sometimes four dollars an hour in tips, was taxed at a rate of $7.25. So her wage that she got from her employer went entirely to, t to the taxes. And she was living completely off of her tips, which were so low that she couldn't actually afford to eat. She says, Saru, I'm ashamed to admit it, but myself and the other women, because it was all women serving, as it is 70% of tipped workers in America are women, the other women and I would flirt with the, 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 the cooks and the managers to get extra food to eat because we were so hungry and we couldn't afford food. Well, one night, Claudia worked a full night shift at the IHOP in Houston, Texas, and a couple walked out without paying the bill at the end of the night. And uh, the manager said, even though it's illegal and IHOP is a mega corporation, you're going to be held liable for that bill, which was $20 more than everything Claudia had earned that entire night, meaning that Claudia ended up paying $20 for the luxury of having worked a full night shift at the IHOP in Houston, Texas. And that story may sound outrageous, but I've been on a 200-city book tour. I was, I've spoken in very conservative parts of the country. And one place that I spoke was northwest Arkansas, where actually Walmart is headquartered, uh, and where they do things to our chicken that you don't want to know about. Um, and a conservative state legislature was to speak right, state legislator was to speak right after me. He got up right after me. I thought he was going to say, she's crazy. She doesn't know what she's talking about. He said, thank you very much to what she said. I have to say, that happened to me every night I worked in the restaurant industry. It's happened so frequently. In fact, the US Department of Labor reports an 80% violation rate with regard to tips, tip theft and employers not making sure that tips make up the difference between the lower minimum wage and the overall minimum wage. Right. The thing is that the restaurant industry likes to say it's okay that these workers earn $2.13 an hour, and they paint a picture of a guy, a white guy generally, working at Chez Panisse, a, a really fancy restaurant here in Berkeley, earning a ton of money in tips, doing quite well. When in fact, 70% of tipped workers in America are women. They work at the IHOP and the Red Lobster and the Olive Garden and Denny's. They earn a median wage, including tips, of $8.70 an hour, including tips. They suffer from three three times the poverty rate of the rest of the US workforce and use food stamps at double the rate of the rest of the US workforce, which means the women who put food on our tables in America cannot actually afford to feed their own families. And here is something else that the parent of any daughter, of any young woman, should care a lot about. Something that's hurt me a lot as I've traveled around the country. I myself have two young daughters. The restaurant industry, by forcing these women to actually have to pander for their income from customers rather than getting an income from their employers, subjects them to literally and statistically the worst sexual harassment of any industry in the United States. 7% of American women work in restaurants, but 37% of all sexual harassment claims to the EEOC come from the restaurant industry. I can tell you hundreds of members of ours who are told, go home, dress more sexy, show more cleavage, and come back so that you can get more tips and sell more food. Right? When a woman must rely on the customer, on the largesse of customers, she must put up with whatever the customer might do, treat, touch, or talk to her in order to get her income because her income doesn't actually come from her employer. So the good news is that there, we are having this we are having this conversation here today because there is tremendous momentum to change this. Tremendous momentum to raise the minimum wage for tipped workers, for non-tipped workers, 
for women, for restaurant workers, and for all low-wage workers. There is a bill moving through the Senate right now, and there are minimum wage fights going on in at least 40 cities and states around the country, many of which I'm very deeply involved in myself. And what is the National Restaurant Association saying in response? What are their primary, primary arguments for why anybody should be earning $2.13 an hour? Why they should be the only industry that gets away with actually not having to comply with the minimum wage? And why all workers should earn about $7 an hour? There are three primary arguments they bring up. The first, you've actually just heard, right? The idea that it will kill jobs, kill jobs, kill jobs, right? So, I want to take a step back because you hear the word consensus a lot on both sides of the aisle. There are economists on both sides of the aisle that say there's a consensus that it has little or no employment effect. There's consensus that it will have a dramatic killing job effect, right? And, uh, you know, there is a professor here at UC Berkeley named Michael Reich who's been in this debate friendly debate with Professor Newmark for over two decades, uh, and I'm sure if you, wanted to in, if you wanted to hear a precise methodological debate about the things that Professor Newmark presented, you would have invited Michael Reich to speak, and, and I, I encourage you to look at his data uh, and how this back and forth occurs. I'm not Michael Reich, I'm not an economist, but I will tell you some things that I do know. You know, this consensus that's been emerging on, uh, you know, supposed consensus on one side or the other side has resulted in some interesting things. Uh, a few months ago, some of you may know, the Economic Policy Institute drafted a letter indicating that the consensus is there is little or no employment effect. The letter was signed by 600 economists, eight Nobel laureates, eight, I'm sorry, seven Nobel laureates, eight former presidents of the American Economic Association and was presented to legislators and the White House and all of these folks. So in response, right-leaning economists uh, got together, supposedly. 500 of these economists signed a letter. They had four Nobel laureates, so slightly less. And they said there's a consensus that there's actually a, a negative employment effect, right? Uh, <laughs> the New York Times then reported and found that that letter on the, on the opposition that said 500 economists say there is, uh, you know, consensus on the other side that it will kill jobs. The New York Times then exposed that that letter was actually drafted and initiated by the very same National Restaurant Association, right? And Jared Bernstein, former White House economist, said, uh, it's very interesting that there's a letter from 500 economists that says we are concerned that these minimum wage increases will impact low-wage people, that it was entirely about, you know, this, this sympathy for low-wage people and that it was actually drafted and initiated by the National Restaurant Association, whose primary interest is to ensure that employers within the National Restaurant Association can increase their profits, right? So, you know, if you're a layperson and a non-economist and you hear, you know, 600, 600 economists on this side and 500 economists on this side, 600 economists saying there's consensus of little or no employment effects, 500 economists uh, saying there's consensus that there is employment effects, what do you do? What I would suggest you do is that we look at our lived experience as people in the United States. And I would point to a couple of things. On the issue of the tipped minimum wage, which the Restaurant Association also says having to actually pay their workers a wage would kill the restaurant industry, five out of seven, seven states in the United States have the same wage for tipped and non-tipped workers. Five out of seven of those states have a faster restaurant industry growth rate than the restaurant industry nationally. We ran a regression and found that the states with the highest tipped minimum wages are correlated with the highest restaurant sales per capita in the United States, meaning that the restaurant industry is doing best where it's paying its workers the most. Other lived experience for anybody who lives in the Bay Area, Michael Reich and Ken Jacobs from UC Berkeley recently published a book about San Francisco called When Mandates Work. So if you live in the Bay Area, you know anything about San Francisco, uh, there have been decades of talk about how San Francisco is going to plummet into the toilet because it has some of, it had for many years the highest minimum wage in the United States. It's had very strong mandates around health care and paid sick days and a number of living wage ordinances, right? Predictions, you know, all, if all the predictions are true on the right side of the consensus, then San Francisco should be obliterated, really, with regard to jobs. 
The book showed that San Francisco's job growth has actually been extremely similar and parallel to all the surrounding counties. And with regard to the restaurant industry, the restaurant industry experienced a slightly higher job growth in San Francisco than the surrounding counties. And for anybody who lives in the Bay Area, we consider San Francisco a destination restaurant experience. Um, there's nobody who would argue that the restaurant industry in San Francisco is suffering with the highest minimum wage in the United States. So I guess I would say there is a debate. We do need to hear that there's consensus on one side and consensus on the other side, which to me means there isn't consensus, right? Uh, but what we do need to look at is our lived experience and particularly what Ron Unz pointed out, which is the overall impact. What the Congressional Budget Office sa actually said was, I, I did not, what the Congressional Budget actually said, what the Congressional Budget Office actually said is not what has been said, but what they actually said, and technically if you look at the report, is that they don't actually know what the impact would be. They said the impact could be between zero and a million jobs, and it reflected this lack of consensus. We don't actually know. It could be as little as zero, it could be as million jobs. We don't actually know. What we do know is that a rise in the minimum wage would impact 24.5 million workers in America. We do know that it would lift almost a million people out of poverty. We do know that it would actually help our economy. Those were things the Congressional Budget Office actually wrote. And I encourage you to look at that report. The second argument the Restaurant Association likes to make is this idea that it will raise the cost of food so high none of us will be able to eat out. Well, I got together with academics at UC Davis and we used USDA methodology and we applied the bill that is currently moving through Congress to every single worker along the food chain, from farm workers to meat and poultry processing workers to restaurant and retail workers. Every single one, and we assumed, we assumed that employers would pass on 100% of the wage increase to their consumers at every level. The title of the report is a dime a day because we found that the average American household would have to pay 10 cents more in total for all food bought outside of the home, that's groceries and restaurants combined, if the wage went up as proposed in Congress. For, and that would mean an increase for 30 million workers in the US, right? So minimal wage increase. And the final argument they make is, is something similar to what we've hear, heard here today about teenagers. You know, who are these workers? Who are tipped workers? I've already told you they paint the picture of the guy working at Chez Panisse. Who are low wage workers, who are minimum wage workers, who are restaurant workers? They are teenagers, they are young people, they are low skilled workers, they are non-professionals. Uh, they are throwaway workers, in other words. And it, it, it's okay that they earn these wages. Well, I've already told you that 70% of tipped workers are women. Uh, what I didn't tell you is that uh, over 60% are over the age 24. See, over 60% of restaurant workers are over the age of 24. The median age is actually in the late 30s. Almost half are parents, a quarter are single mothers. And so it's hard for me to understand how raising the wages of 10 million workers in our industry, the industry that I've spent several decades studying, when they are the lowest wage workers, when they are parents and families and largely adults, how that would not impact their families. And when I hear that it would be better to help these workers earn their way out of poverty, these are full-time workers earning and still living in poverty. So yes, we should help them earn their way out of poverty, by paying them a wage that allows them to have one job that allows them to support themselves and not have to rely on public assistance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And that was a very, very stimulating group of presentations, I must say. I, I found myself in agreement on this point, this point, this point, and now I'm asking myself at the end, where, where does that leave me? Uh, so this is our time for Q&A, and also I know that each of our panelists probably has a response to the, the remarks of the other speakers, but what I'm going to suggest is we leave their kind of rebuttal comments or their final observations towards the end, so they will also have the questions they have heard from the floor uh, to put into their summation remarks. Uh, first question right here. Sure. Thank you very much. I found the conversation most enlightening and 
I, like you, went back and forth. I'm an employer with almost 500 people that I take very seriously my responsibility to make sure that they have a livable wage. My concern with uh, the minimum wage proposals as I hear them right now is on wage compression. So I'd like to know what is being, what, where the studies are and what's happening in the field of wage compression because so many of my employees who may be at 16, 17 an hour now if I've got minimum wage workers bumping up, I'm going to have to raise. So what will be the cause and effect there? What will be the, the overall effect in general on the economy? So, so first of all, one thing to, to be absolutely clear on, anyone who says I can point to the research and say what a $15 minimum wage is going to do is, is being incredibly reckless, right? Because there is no research on increase of that, increases of that magnitude. So whether you're talking about price increases or employment increases or wage compression, it's guesswork, OK? What we do know is what, what has happened in the past. That's, that's the data we have. And those have, have been smaller increases, right? Um, uh, the evidence says there's a little bit of sort of nudge up of wages in England. They have a great expression, knock-on effects, they call them, which I like, of a little bit, little bit of knock-on effect on people somewhat above the minimum wage. And it happens for one of two reasons. One is kind of the thing you're probably talking about, which is maybe I preserve a wage spread between the starting job and the next job because that's sort of an incentive to do well and get a little promotion. So it's kind of a personnel economic. So in that sense, the minimum wage is a constraint it sort of forces up your wages higher than the minimum. The alternative is, and this is probably what happens in the data to a greater extent, is that employers shift their hiring from those lowest skilled workers to somewhat more higher skilled workers. And there's plenty of research that shows that happens. So you actually bid up the wages. So your, your worker who now earns above the minimum, there's going to be more people who want to hire that guy or, or, that, or that woman, right? Because you're trying to get more skilled workers. And that will force up their wages. From your perspective, it doesn't matter, right? It's a higher wage either way. But the research says there's some of that. Not a lot, but again, that's, that's in relation to small minimum wage increases, because that's all we know with confidence. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree very much with that, in that, for example, if you raise the California minimum wage to $12 an hour up for everybody, it probably would cause wage increases for people right now earning, say, 12 or 13 or even 14. But above that, the impact would probably be negligible. Yeah, I would just add that uh, what we haven't talked about actually is uh, how so you know I think there's a Professor Newmark said there's a you know there's a common sense right you pay you have to pay something more therefore you'll 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 buy it less right there's a common sense um, I, I think what we didn't get a chance to talk about is how is it uh, that there is actually evidence that there is little or no employment effect how could that be possible if there's common sense that if something costs more you have to buy it less well what we haven't talked about are the, actually the employment benefits that emerge from higher wages right and i'm sure as an employer who pays livable wages you've experienced this far lower turnover higher worker productivity um, more loyalty greater retention I, i'm I, no so from the san francisco experience which was well documented after the minimum wage went you know, to the highest in any, any place in the country in San Francisco, we saw lower turnover, improvements in worker performance, worker morale, less absenteeism, less grievances, less disciplinary issues, and greater customer service. We saw a 2.8% increase in restaurant prices, to be sure, uh, but, and that is translated into what I call the dime a day, pennies more on your restaurant meal. Right? So for pennies more on our restaurant meal, employers can enjoy less turnover and all of these other benefits, and consumers can enjoy knowing that somebody's not living in poverty. I'll just give one other source of evidence of this. Uh, we worked with Rose Batt, from the, a professor at the Cornell School of um, Industrial and Labor Relations, and we did a two-part study. We worked with about 100 of our employers, many of whom are you know, 500. You know, I would say anywhere from 50 to 500 is their general range in terms of employees. We found that all of them experienced massively less turnover as a result of higher wages and better benefits. That was a qual qualitative study. We then did a quantitative study where we actually surveyed 1,100 restaurant employers across the country and uh, to ask how do uh, wages and benefits relate to turnover rates. And we found that you could cut your turnover in half in fact, employers had experienced cutting their turnover in half in the industry with the highest turnover rates in the entire economy, had cut their turnover in half with higher wages and better benefits. Good question over here. Years ago, in an undergraduate sociology class, we actually did a little bit of looking at the minimum wage issue. And one of the things that I remember from that was when 
the employers were talking about a job loss, and in this case, most currently, up between zero and, and a million. So let's, let's take the 500,000 number, that that wasn't losing current jobs, but that most often that that was a reduction in projected employment in the future. So that it's a purely speculative number that is based on no research other than employers saying, well, we were going to employ two million extra people in the next five years. Now we're only going to employ a million, so you've lost a million jobs. Can you guys respond to that, you're, please? You're confusing two things. I mean, it's, it's true that, that what, 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 what does not happen is that the minimum wage goes up and a lot of people get fired the next day, right? What, what does happen for the most part, and there's a lot of, you know, plenty of evidence on this, is that, is that hiring slows. You've got to remember, though, even, even though a higher wage does reduce turnover, low-skilled labor markets are very high. People turn over very quickly in those jobs, right? So firms are, firms, employment can fall. It's not employment falling in absolute terms, right? If that was true, we'd have, you know, automation would have eliminated all our jobs, as were the minimum wage. What's, what's, what we're talking about is what happens to what would have happened otherwise. But the research is not speculative. The research is not based on employers' responses. The research is based on counting employed people. And what you see is in the future, and no one said, City's going to go into the toilet, or there's not going to be any jobs. I mean, that's just hyperbole, which doesn't further the debate. There'll be modest reductions in employment, and it's coming about. You, if you get somewhat slower hiring with turnover continuing even at a lower rate, employment will fall relative to what it would have been before. That's what you're. That's what the studies, whatever you think of them, that's the kind of thing the studies are trying to measure. No one, no one serious thinks we should ask employers what they're going to. I mean, not that the restaurant association wouldn't wouldn't survey employers and advertise that because they would, but no serious economist. Would, would make a statement about the evidence shows job loss or change in anything else based on what people say they're going to do. But it's also uh, hyperbole uh, to assume that all, all of these low-wage jobs are, ne ne are by necessity high turnover jobs. I mean, that is just... Turnover rates are higher in low-wage jobs. That's a fact. But that's it's not, not true across the board. It is. Because I can, I can present jobs. you with... I don't know what your turnover rates yeah. are, but I can present you with... Uh, like I said, over a hundred employers who have almost no turnover, with you know moderately wa moderate wage jobs because they pay slightly higher than the minimum. Well, question: I wonder if you'll allow me the liberty of asking one question. I can't restrain myself no, here. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> but you know, one of the issues I keep coming to is how do we incent better behavior by employers? That's the thing I keep coming back to. Uh, it was interesting, there was an article in the Chronicle or Times today about Walmart, and they're going to buy more organic, and it's talking about the huge impact that it can have. We could also talk about Walmart. I mean, so I've heard these statistics about how much, talk about concentration of wealth, how much money the, the leaders of the Walton family have. And then we talked about, they're saying, well, maybe raising the minimum wage would be good for Walmart, and I can't help but ask, well, why don't you just raise the wages of your employees? I mean, they're a monopoly in so many situations. Why aren't they doing that? And on Saru's point, I've been, you know, full disclosure, I'm involved with a company called Revolution Foods as an investor and an advisor. And they, uh, they have about 1,000 employees. For the second straight year, they've been the second highest, fastest growing company in the inner city. Their minimum wage is the living wage. They give stock options to every... Starting, the starting wage. The starting yes, the starting wage is the living wage in that community. They have always given health benefits to, to employees, and they give stock options. And the point is, their turnover is much lower in an industry where it's rampant, and they benefit from it. So I'm just wondering, how do we... I don't mean to champion them so much as challenge the Walmarts of the world. They could do so much without devastating their companies. And, and actually, that, uh, the, all of the organic for Walmart, that was a result of consumer demand. Consumers mm -hmm. actually demanding uh, that Walmart do better. So we, we've thought a lot about employer incentives. We've created an app, which you can download for free, called the ROC National Diners Guide, that actually tells you how the 150 most popular restaurants in America are faring on issues of wages and benefits and promotion. It, award, it gives awards to restaurants around the company that are doing the right thing. These restaurants have posted these awards in their windows. They've seen more consumers demanding, do you pivot, pay, you know, asking, do you provide a livable wage using our app? Uh, and we've sat, seen it had a tremendous 
tremendous impact and more and more employers wanting to associate with us because they want that label. Well, the, the problem is there's a collective action problem here in that I, I think you can make a very strong case that Walmart and all of its competitors would benefit from a much higher minimum wage. In other words, all they would have to do would be raise the prices by 1% or so one time. The consumers wouldn't mind at all. Meanwhile, the workers who get those higher wages across all of society would be exactly the workers shopping at Walmart, which tends to cater to the lower market community. And that would provide a boom for Walmart and all of its competitors. But it's difficult for any one of them to take that action separately. Because Revolution Foods, for example, is, I assume, a fairly small company compared to the size That's of Walmart. Employees. Yeah, exactly. Walmart has, what is it, 1.3 mil million employees in America? And Walmart's competitors, if Walmart, for example, raised its minimum wage to $12 an hour, but none of its competitors did, Walmart's selling point is that it has rock bottom prices. So a 1% increase isn't serious if all of the competitors also raise their prices by 1%. But if none of their competitors do, then Walmart might really have some problems. If Walmart and all of its competitors got together in a room and agreed to collectively raise their, <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to say, and collectively raise their wages to $12 an hour as the starting level, that would be illegal and they'd all go to prison. Therefore, it's needed for the federal government or state governments to provide that legal framework, allowing them to do what they'd want to do. And, and that's why Walmart, yeah. for example, back in 19, uh, I guess it was 2005, the Walmart CEO actually testified before Congress that he wanted the federal minimum wage increased because it would be good for Walmart. Yeah. And that's why they're saying the same thing And right actually, now. that's why our yeah, sure. award winners in our app come with us to Congress saying, we, yeah. we can do this, but we need policies that will actually risk, lift standards across the exactly. board. David, so I, I want to hear from David on this point, but I also want to ask this question. Let's, you know, I'm again looking at the comments in your slides. Let's just accept that you are right on the impact on employment. At the same time, let's, let's just concede that that's correct. At the same time, there's a stimulus in the economy, all those other people having, you know, more money Super to spend balance. and the like. How do you, in collecting and evaluating this data balance, though, saying, oh, yes, there are going to be fewer jobs, but the jobs that exist are much better, and there's a stimulant effect, and there's going to be less impact on social welfare costs. Right. Well, I'd, I'd encourage you to watch Fiddler on the Roof after this debate, because the great scene in Fiddler on the Roof, where two rabbis are talking, and Tevye's talking to him, he says, he says, you're right. And then the other guy talks, and he says, and you're right, too. And then the third guy says, wait, they can't both be right. And he says, and you're right, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, oh, so, so let me do these in reverse order. Yeah. Well, let me do not in reverse order. I think, I think things like consumer, um, consumer pressure, whatever, on campaigns are great. If a consumer wants to you know, buy a, when you buy a product, I just I spent time in Japan, right? When you go, if those of you who have been to Japan, everything is really nice. There's no Walmart. The Japanese people would never go to a Walmart because they want really high service. They wouldn't, you know, they don't want to wait on line. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's remarkable. Just, just different standards of service. And what that says is when you consume a product or a service, it's not just, you know, the bottle of water I get, but how I get it and what the service is like and everything else. And if, you, if, if, people, if, if some consumers will say, you know, I'd rather pay more because part of what I'm getting is not just the meal, but, you know, the good feelings, whatever, that this person isn't living at low wages. That's great. That's, you know, we did that with, there was, um, uh, college campuses have had pretty successful sort of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, about, you know, campaigns about the apparel, right, now I'm picking them sweatshops, and, and what we, there's research, Richard Freeman did research, that people, one, after those campaigns took effect, people were willing to pay more for sort of the Berkeley sweatshirt that was, you know, made in America, probably not, very high wages, but higher than Indonesian wages. Um, uh, the, the stimulation, the, the economic stimulus argument, you know, there's really, I, I, there's very few credible economists who think the stimulus amounts to much of anything. I mean, and there's no study showing it is. There's a Chicago Fed study that gets cited incorrectly. Um, sorry, I, I don't want to go into the details. But the, ba I mean, the, the basic point is right. Poor people spend a higher share of their income than, than richer people. But the difference isn't big, right? And remember that saving is also valuable. Now, during a recession, saving is a problem. This was Keynes' great insight. If everyone saves all at once, it's a bad thing. But you need saving to finance investment and growth. So, so this, this economic stimulus argument, I don't think, is the right argument. I mean, there are legitimate debates about who's helped and will the government, will you save the government money and all that. But, but this notion that it's a massive stimulus is, 
it's, it's speculation. It's not supported by studies. We have another question in the middle, which unfortunately, because of time, I think will be our last question. Yes, I've been active with some of the Berkeley activity where they're talking about a minimum wage versus a living wage. And I'm kind of, I've, I found that not to be real accurate. I think the minimum wage is a perspective from corporations and business owners, and the living wage is what is it, it is from the perspective of an employee. What does it take to have a living wage where you don't have to have second and third or tertiary or underground employment or income generation? I'm wondering what do you do in terms of, I think it's a comparison. What is your minimum wage that corporations have to pay and what's the living wage that you would compare it to? What do you do when people ask you, how do you determine a living wage? Can I just, I, sometimes there's confusion with the terminology. So um, minimum wage is generally thought of as what uh, a, a policy, a government might set as a floor, right? <laughs> living wage, it, usually, you know. It's a starting wage. Yeah, it's generally a starting wage. Uh, living wage is generally a type, a specific type of policy that a locality might implement um, that is generally only applicable to uh, public employees or anybody associated with the city, so contractors of the city. So a better term for, I think, what you're referring to is a livable wage. Really what we want for workers is a wage that they can live on, right? It's a livable wage. So living wage is a very specific turn of art. So livable wage, right? Uh, there are many different calculators of livable wage. The Economic Policy Institute has a calculator that you, where you can go in, look at your region, your particular region, because it obviously depends on your, your region. And you know, considering everything from childcare to transportation um, to you know, the cost of food, all of those things, it can calculate for you what a livable wage would actually be in your region. And I will tell you that for most reason, regions in the United States, it ranges from about 18 to about $25 an hour. That's a true livable wage, in, considering all of the things that it takes to live in the United States with a family. Um, and none of the minimum wage debates that we're talking about anywhere in the country right now remotely approach a true livable wage, which is why you know the idea of arguing for, for more, because we really need to be arguing for more. You know, seven. Think of it this way: seven dollars is. Uh, if the minimum wage had risen with inflation, and I know there's lots of different people who use lots of different numbers, but I will say it, it is between 15 and 19, 1850 or something like that, if the minimum wage had actually risen with inflation, if the chart that Professor Newmark had shown, if, if it had risen with inflation, that's where we'd actually be. And that's uh, more comparable to what a livable wage might be for a worker in the United States, right? OK, I'm now uh, we're getting towards the end of our time. I want to uh, ask each of our panelists to make some closing observations, anything they think we should be tracking and following. I'm going to suggest that David go first because of his time constraints. And so if he feels the need to leave after his remarks, that's fine. <laughs> and I'll thank everyone in advance for being here and also for participating. A lot of food for thought here. No pun intended. Yes, have, no pun uh, intended. <laughs> Yeah. I have a very important constraint because my son is in from college and we have Giants tickets, so uh, that's that, that's my just so you know. Yeah, what really matters. That's no. transparency. Um, right, right, right. Okay. Um, I mean, we could go on and on, as you can probably imagine. Let, let me just make a, cu a couple observations, and, and I'm I'm looking down my list, and I'll maybe just one, maybe a couple more. Um, I don't think there's there's much disagreement, except among sort of the extreme right that we want to do something to address the inequality problem, right? right? Rich societies, you know, so that's us and the European countries and Japan, the sort of industrialized rich countries, all adopt some, some view of there's a minimally acceptable standard of living and then there's a lot of different ways to get to it and it's not, it's not entirely clear what the best one is. What we have right now, which is a hodgepodge of programs, is probably a bad idea. I don't think a blanket high minimum wage is a great idea. I think the negative income tax, which we talked about and discarded many decades ago, is probably a more workable, more workable idea. But I think the key, the key to this is all of these policies entail the big R word, which is redistribution, right? Because the bottom line is um, we probably can't do enough to raise skills at the bottom anywhere near fast enough to make a serious dent in inequality. And anyways, if you recall from my very first chart, a lot of what's going on in inequality is people at the top doing really well to the median, and none of this has to do with, with, with sort of that comparison. So um, I think a lot of people think 
is, you know, this is a problem and we have to redistribute from someone to solve it and we can uh, debate the details. Um, keep in mind the difference between redistributing through the tax and credit system and redistributing for the minimum wage. If, if we have, say, an earned income tax credit, um, then you're, you're, you know, you're, it comes, it is, where does that money come from? It comes from taxes, where it com comes from taxes, obviously, right? Who pays the most taxes? We may not pay, think they pay a big enough share, but who pays the most taxes? Rich people, obviously, because they make the most money. So you're redistributing from people who make a lot to people who make a little, okay? Who does the minimum wage distribute from? It redistributes from, from businesses that hire very low wage workers, right? And that's not, by the way, the Walmarts of the world, because Walmart does pay above minimum wages. It's much more often small businesses, um, the owners of whom, some of them make a lot of money, and some of them don't. It's a very strange redistribution policy, um, unless you think it's just their fault that they're paying low wages. But economists who think in terms of markets don't think that's the case. Um, so I think you know, embracing the notion that the government has to do something, the market is not going to solve the problem, to, to, to help rectify the problem of inequality, which is exacerbated, is fine. But I think any sensible redistribution policy is gonna to wanna to ask, are we largely distributing from those who have the very most to those who have the very least? And the minimum wage it clearly doesn't do that. It, it redistributes in, in a very strange and probably, uh, judgment, it's a judgment term, but probably an equitable way. Thank you. Ron? Okay, uh, it seems to me what's really happened over the last 40 or 45 years is that the minimum wage has not only dropped by about one third in inflationary terms, but it's dropped by more like two thirds relative to per capita GNP. In other words, what we've seen is a total collapse at the low wage level relative to what's happened in our society. Oh, sorry. If you go back uh, 30 or 40 years ago, people could get by on a minimum wage job, and now they can't. And, and that's a huge problem. At the same time, there's been a gigantic growth in all these complex and expensive government social welfare programs to make up the difference. The problem with it is not only, you know, I think there are negative ill effects to these social welfare programs in general, but the programs are so patchwork and complex Nobody can even say how much an individual worker gets. In other words, when you're talking about raising the minimum wage, one reason it's difficult to calculate the changes in government spending is there are so many programs, so many complex formulas, nobody can really do the calculation. The nice thing about a much higher minimum wage, it's a very simple, robust policy. In other words, instead of somebody, for example, having to hire a tax preparer, and pay them hundreds or even thousands of dollars a year to get their earned income tax credit, which is totally unpredictable otherwise, everybody knows that they would get 12 or 13 or $11 an hour in their paycheck. They would get it every week. It would be spread out through the year, and they wouldn't have the same sorts of problems. The only argument, I think, against a much higher minimum wage is the question of job loss. In other words, would a lot of low-wage workers lose their jobs? which is obviously the concern that David Newmark and a lot of the other people purportedly tend to make. But it, it seems to me the data shows it's a very small factor. In other words, if you take the worst possible case of hundreds of thousands or a million jobs being lost, according to the CBO studies or the other studies with the federal minimum wage hike, we're talking for every 20 or 30 or 50 workers who gets an increase in income of 30% or 50% life-changing amounts, one worker might lose his job. And, and the ratio is just enormous. What we're talking about is a situation, you know, if the only downside risk is workers possibly losing their jobs, then why don't we ask the workers involved? In other words, if the only people who could vote on whether to raise the federal minimum wage are those tens of millions of low-wage workers, it would probably pass with 90% of the vote because they would know that for everyone who might lose his job, there are 30 or 40 who would gain tremendously. And also, if you're losing a $7 an hour or $7.50 an hour job, you're in terrible poverty right now. If you lose your job, you're still in terrible poverty. You're not really losing all that much. Well, on the other hand, if your wage goes up by 50% or 80%, your life has changed entirely. Also, let's look at things at an empirical level. I, I'm somebody who doesn't have an economics background. You have 500 economists on one side, 500 economists on the other, 600 on the other side. <laughs> California raised its minimum wage by 35% in 1996. 
The critics at the time, through an initiative process, Hilda Solis's initiative, the critics said it would destroy the economy, it would cause massive unemployment. Instead, unemployment dropped by one third in the four years that followed. A huge minimum wage increase, a huge decline in unemployment. Oh, I, I, I know. Oh, it, it, right, but I'm saying, uh, uh, let's take another case, San Jose. <laughs> San Jose just raised its minimum wage by 25% a little over a year ago. Again, the critics said it would cause massive unemployment, massive job loss. Unemployment in San Jose dropped by two full percentage points in the year that followed. Now, there are all sorts of complicating factors. I'm certainly not saying that proves a huge rise in the minimum wage causes a huge decline in unemployment. But when you see those effects in the two empirical cases you have in California, and the case of San Francisco, which had the highest minimum wage in the country, and a huge decline in local unemployment, it shows the ill effects can't be nearly as bad as some of the critics make them out to be. So if we're talking about a situation where the beneficiaries or the people would be impacted by the low wage workers very much wanted, if the evidence is the loss in unemployment would be relatively negligible, and the impact on the rest of society would be tremendously beneficial. It seems like a very good idea to do. Feel free to go. So you actually don't have to speculate about what low wage workers want, um, because you know we've surveyed about 6,000 restaurant workers across the country, and I'm involved in about 10 ballot initiatives across the country where we've paid for polls in each of those places, polling the populace, Republican and Democratic alike. And actually, you came very close to hitting the number. It's 88% in favor, <laughs> Republican and Democratic alike, of raising the wage, even after hearing the kinds of arguments we've heard today that it will create job loss. Even after hearing those negative comments, 88% of the population in states like Michigan, in Washington, D.C., in Alaska, in Minnesota, still favor raising the wage. Um, and I really think, you know, you are hearing two sides of a de debate, absolutely. I really think it's important to really understand the parties involved, it, it, you know, who are funding both sides of the debate or who are, what are the, who are the interests, right? And we know for a fact that the largest, most moneyed vocal uh, interest on the side of the debate that says it's going to kill jobs is the National Restaurant Association. That has been exposed again and again and again. And when you know who you the National the Restaurant side, so You didn't say who the other side is funded by. Well, the, the other side is organizations like mine. Labor unions. I'm not a labor union. No, I know, but they, fund, they put in a lot more than your organization. Well, okay, let's talk about that. Labor unions. What kind of interest? Let, let's, let's talk about the self-interest of both sides. If I'm the National Restaurant Association, my self-interest is to keep wages as low as possible so I can maximize profits. If I'm a labor union, it, doesn't, it isn't actually in my self-interest to raise the overall minimum wage because my competitive advantage that I have in selling what I do to workers out there is that I can raise your wages in a way that nobody else can. So raising a, a policy that raises the wage for everybody isn't actually in the, in the self-interest of a union. So, so let's talk about the National Restaurant Association. We heard it, you know, it's not you know, large CEOs or wealthy people who would be impacted by a minimum wage increase. It's at small businesses. But who is the National Restaurant Association? The National Restaurant Association is led almost entirely by Fortune 500 restaurant corporations, McDonald's, Burger King, Yum Brands, which is Taco Bell, KFC, Pizza Hut, Darden, which is the world's largest full service restaurant company, is the most vocal advocate on the, on the minimum wage, that's Red Lobster, Olive Garden, uh, Capital Grill Steakhouse, Longhorn Steakhouse, Seasons 52, and about eight other brands, right? These are the leaders of the National Restaurant Association. These are the primary folks funding this side of the debate. So you have to keep in mind their self-interest, and it is not small businesses. Small businesses are with us. You know, as I've said, we've organized them to say, actually, we believe in an increase to the minimum wage because we've seen that it reduces turnover, increases productivity, and ultimately <laughs> satisfies everybody. And, you know, whether there's evidence of it or not, people in their lived experience uh, experience exactly what you said, Dick, which is, if these workers are paid more, they will spend more. Okay. Well, this has been a, a terrific panel.